It's a good question. I think companies can be a lot more innovative and creative around how they raise brand awareness for their company. Obviously, a lot of companies will have their LinkedIn pages, which are pretty active. But I think there's a huge opportunity for TA teams, particularly, to build on their personal brand or their company image using. All right, we're live. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Life Sciences 360. And today I have Hamish Ilangaratne with me. He is the founder of rxgroup.io, a life science recruiting specialist firm that helps companies hire for quality assurance talent. Welcome to the show, Hamish. Thank you, Hosh. Thanks for having me. First, my first ever podcast, so I'm very excited. Yeah, you, you, <laughs> we're going to have a lot of fun and, and we're going to also create a lot of value for the audience. So I want to start off by asking you, how did you end up in life sciences recruiting? Uh, well, I didn't plan to go into it. Um, I suppose I, the, the common term is that you fell into recruitment, um, which probably about 99% of people do. I went to Durham University. I did a biomedical science degree, probably just because I got led down the science route at school. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. And I was applying for, sorry, and then I did a, a law degree. So I did a law conversion course after biomed. Um, again, didn't really know what to do. And I was applying for sort of random sales jobs, um, I suppose, because of, uh, in addition to, to training contracts in, in law firms and got a call from a, a rec to rec, uh, you know, a recruitment company who specialize in placing recruitment consultants and um, didn't know anything about recruitment, hadn't, hadn't done anything in it. But because I didn't have a job, I thought, well, let's go for it. So I went for the interview, somehow managed to get get the job. I got offered a few positions and started with a company called S3 or Real Staffing Group, who are the life sciences group. So S3 is a big global FTSE STEM recruitment company. And they were just building out their pharmaceutical biotech team. I think there were about four people at the time. And so I was, I was about the fifth or sixth person in the UK. And they put me on the quality assurance market. I didn't know anything. I didn't know, didn't know what QA or quality assurance was, but just was fortunate enough to get off to a good start. And you know, I enjoyed the company. I really liked the company. It's a great company to work for. I learned a lot, had some good fun in my early days and, you know, and really enjoyed the market. So after about a year or so, actually, I thought hey, you can make a good career into this and just progress from there, really. So, you know, didn't plan to go into it. Um, and then 11 years later, here I am. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's the story of a lot of people that I've talked to. So one, you, you had your more than a decade of uh, career in life sciences recruiting. Talk to me a little bit about the transition. How, what was going on and how did you just, dis- what was a point in life where you decided, yep, this is good, but I'm going to go start something and, and talk a little bit about rxgroup.io. Yeah, I mean, I've always, I think after maybe about five or six years, I thought I would love to do this on my own at some point. And I actually went into a leadership role after about four or five years um, and grew the team and ended up sort of being responsible for a team of about 30 consultants specializing in life science recruitment in, in the UK, but always had this itch to go out and do my own thing. And for me, it was just waiting you know I, was, I, I could have carried on doing the job that i was doing but it was probably the last year or two going a bit going through the motions because i had this itch to go out and do something on my own and i think the reason why i wanted to do that is because you know i felt like i've i've, I've done the, a, a good job in my career for 10 11 years and i wanted the choice you know i wanted to set myself up for the future and i think having your own business and i had the energy to do this now I thought it was the right time to do it. I could have waited for another three, four, five years and probably wouldn't have the energy or the time to be able to do that with your personal situation. You know, I might have, I'm, I'm, you know, at the moment I don't have kids. So I've got, you know, I don't have that extra responsibility. So yeah, I thought it was the right time to do it. So yeah, we set up or I, you know, about five weeks ago now. So this is our fifth week. Yeah, it's been a whirlwind. It's gone very quickly, very intense, long hours, focusing purely on the US, the US market, which is something I've not done before. So yeah, all, all very brand new, but very exciting. Yeah, it, it is. I've, I started Cultivate less than a year ago, but the, the first year is always so special because you're, you're executing on so many different things that you had in mind, ideas, some work out, some don't, and you you really have to like flip the page and just try something else because business or doing something, starting your own business or agency or 
anything you do on your own, it's 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 more of an art. There isn't a right or wrong way to do it. So you just kind of have to use your strengths and and figure it out. So yeah, g- great that you you started that journey five weeks ago, and I I wish you a very long one. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. It feels like a long one already. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so I wanted to ask you, in the time that you've done research to start uh, rxgroup.io and in the last five or six weeks that you've been talking to people, what are some of the common challenges you're seeing when it comes to hiring for quality assurance roles? Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like the, the market at the moment is a very interesting one. It's obviously we've been through uh, since 2020, we had the initial downturn and then there was a big uptick in 2021 and, and a lot of last year. These last few months have been difficult, I think, for the market because, you know, especially within, well, we're seeing it across across industries, but in biotech particularly, a lot of companies are laying people off and making people redundant. So there's there's a lot of talent available at the moment and the challenge is probably flipped a bit from being being a huge shortage of people to actually there's some good talent available in the market. There is still a talent shortage. There's still really specific niche skill sets that companies will need, but it's very hard. It's a difficult market at the moment. It's a difficult one to predict where it's going. You can't really, I think a lot of companies don't have approvals for headcount at the moment. So they might be turning to short-term interim resources. But I suppose the, the main, you know, the challenges will always be, having said that there's a talent short, that there's a available candidates, there's still a talent shortage, right? So the, the amount of the pipeline of cell and gene therapies in the market is set to continue to grow over the next five, 10 years. And this is a, you know, ATMPs is a new, it's a new type of medicine. So there's not huge amounts of people with those skill sets in the market, you know, biologics, it's, it's difficult to find good people with that good, you know, with that relevant experience. So that will be a huge challenge, especially as companies go from clinical development through to commercial, and there's more, more of a need for manufacturing because, the challenges around manufacturing capacity and speed and all of that sort of stuff will will remain. So you know these they're 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 longer term challenges. I suppose short term at the moment, they're, from a candidate perspective, there's there are uh, there's a lot of competition. So working really you know really focusing on what type of role that you want is is important, uh, and what type of company that you want to work for is important because there's a lot of competition for. Um, a lot of competition in the market available at the moment. Great. Yeah, I, I was thinking about this with all the layoffs and everything going on. You touched on this a little bit. I was wondering if is there a still a talent shortage or just all of a sudden there's one role and 50 candidates applying to it. So I'm I'm glad that you touched on that. There still looks like there still seems to be a shortage of good candidates that are a right fit. But in general, you're seeing a lot of candidates that you can select from for a role. Yeah, there, yeah, exactly, exactly that. I think you know, over the course of the next few years, there will there will be a talent shortage. There will be a demand. There will be a bigger demand for people with cell and gene therapy backgrounds. In the last this particular year, the start of this year, the end of last year, because of the I suppose the surge in companies that let people go, it, it's just kind of meant that there's a there's a there's a flood of talent available but that doesn't necessarily mean that the companies are still filling roles quicker, right right because you've still got to find you still got to find relevant talent yep i i want to ask you this i've been in the qa field for for a long time but because you're into the recruiting side and you've probably see like hundreds of profiles and resumes each week what are some of the things that you can share that would help other agencies and recruitment companies or even internal talent acquisition teams? Uh, what are like the top three traits that you would look for when hiring for a quality assurance role? Yeah, look, it depends on obviously the seniority and the, the type of position. Obviously, first and foremost, is this skill set relevant? You know, if you're if you're if you're working with a biotech company that are operating in gene the gene therapy space, you, you're not going to be sending them people with Manu, you know, generics right, or, right. Or, or whatever. Right. So first and foremost, the skill set is is key. Uh, making sure that, I suppose, from a company perspective, making sure they're really clear on the 
the three or four things that they need from this individual. So clarity on the expectation. And then I suppose from a, a candidate perspective, if you're if you're a, if you're a job seeker in this market, making sure that you've got a good network of people is important. So you working with the right recruitment agencies, whether that's four or five, but try and keep that close knit rather than speaking to every single recruitment consult consultant in your market, figure out who the best ones are, connect with them. I think you can do a lot around LinkedIn in terms of building your network, connecting with people daily, engaging with people, commenting on, on people. So you can build a bit of a network by your own stream. And then I suppose just really making sure that you're following up with with all of the all of your connections. So if you meet with a recruitment consultant to talk about the type of role that you want, make sure that you've got a really clear understanding of where your cv or resume is going so work with that recruiter to say right i want to work in north carolina in the cdmo space okay so then map out all of these companies that you would be relevant for who are the key stakeholders within those companies work with the recruiter to try and approach those companies and work with them to really figure out what's going to make your profile stand out i think it's important as well so I think I've gone off on a bit, a bit of a tangent. No, that's, uh, or, that's great. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really, especially with platforms like LinkedIn and other social media, like when I was looking for quality assurance role 10, 12 years ago, my go-to platform at that time was Indeed. And LinkedIn wasn't, maybe it was still there and opportunities were there, but I wasn't as active on LinkedIn 12 years ago. So now with LinkedIn, what has become really useful the platform it's easy to access the right decision maker if you know how to approach them right so linkedin is great tool for that and i want to ask you this this is a related to the topic that i just mentioned about linkedin so the traditional way of interviewing for a role or applying for a role is you either go through a recruiter or you directly apply for the position you go through a phone call and then you have a couple of rounds of interviews and you get the offer in your career, whether in the last five weeks or when you were in past working in the com companies, have you seen any unconventional ways that people have either interviewed a candidate or a candidate has gotten hired and you're scratching your, your head thinking, wow, I, I just don't know how this person got hired or I didn't expect that this company would, you know, be this creative. Um, it's a good question. I don't think, I think companies can be a lot more innovative and creative around how they, how they raise brand awareness for their, for their company. Obviously a lot of companies will have their LinkedIn pages, which are pretty active, but I think there's a huge opportunity for TA teams particularly to build on their personal brand or their company image using video, for example, on LinkedIn. I don't think there's, there's, I don't see much of that from, biotechs from pharma companies because it's, it's a hugely competitive space so nobody is doing that at the moment Correct. so i would have thought when you're recruiting for i'll stick with the cell and gene therapy because it's a really tight knit market but if you're recruiting for a quality director who's got eight to ten years leadership experience and five years in within cell and gene therapy in boston for example there could be five five other companies also doing the same thing, right? So what you've got to think of what sets you apart and how you're going to attract candidates. So I think video, you know, video interviewing or video um, personal branding is is you know what, why why would someone want to work for their company? What's in it for them? What's the career progression? What does it mean for the work that you're doing? What product are you bring to market? What Im impact will that have on the on the on society on, on global health? It's, it's a huge opportunity that companies probably don't aren't taking advantage of at the moment so I, I was having this conversation with someone the other day about about this and they were really you know they were quite interested in hearing right could you help me in doing some of this and like, well, yeah, yeah i mean i, I could yep. um yeah i think there's a huge opportunity for companies to be a bit more innovative uh, around building that that brand awareness yeah i'm not sure that's answered that the, the specific question that you that you you asked, asked me around sort of have i seen other candidates get opportunities yeah probably probably have seen a bit of that but i think that comes back to the the, the requirement and the the recruiter have you have you really taken a clear job description from the from the business to then explain that to the candidate have you have you really understood the requirements of the role and you you brought up a good point about personal branding and using things like video. 
So anybody that's listening to this, this is, I can relate to that because if I were in a leadership role in life sciences right now, looking to hire talent, I would pull out a camera or a phone and record a two minute video, exactly like you have explained. Hey, here's the roles that we're looking for. Here's why it would be fun to work in this department, you know, quality assurance, quality control, compliance, what have you maybe give a little bit of what's going on without giving confidential details like, hey, we're implementing a EQMS or we're doing a gap analysis with this. Say that out because I don't know the percentage of people that actually read every word of the job description, but I'm willing to bet it, it's not a lot of people that go through the job description. So how can you condense that job description into a two minute video, put it out there, put your face, so people can see who you are and then, you know, end it with a call to action saying, hey, if you're interested, check out our careers page or email this person or whatever. I think there's a big opportunity and I haven't seen anyone do that, like you just said. But yeah, go go try it. If anyone's listening, go try it. Yeah, it's it's not a natural thing. You know, everyone, when the minute someone says video, people people don't like it, people don't like being on video, they don't like putting themselves out there, especially on a platform like LinkedIn. But you just have to do it, I suppose. Building your the term personal branding is is just every is, is what how you're perceived in the market. So don't be scared of it. And if it's going to have a, a positive impact on your role and making you find allowing you to find talent better, then it's 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 going to stand you apart. Right. And I want to ask you on the other side of this, right? As a candidate. How do you think candidates can leverage LinkedIn and personal branding to stand out from other candidates when applying for roles? Yeah, again, I think it's a great opportunity for, for candidates looking for work. I was speaking to a contractor, you know, a senior level contractor about this recently, and she's been really putting herself out there on LinkedIn of the, you know, over the last three or four weeks and gaining some real traction, like building new connections, a new network. It's led to a couple of conversations, exploratory conversations. So I do think there's a really big opportunity. A lot of people like the video thing. People are not willing, you know, a bit scared or a bit tentative around being on LinkedIn and posting content. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to start with that. I think start with smaller steps, like connecting with people in your market daily, engaging with their content. So commenting on it liking it and then reaching out to people in your in your network and then just if you know your market well which everyone hopefully does if they're a, if they're looking for work in that field then comment then start talking about what the challenges are start talking about your personal life because people like to see your personality as well start adding value to companies challenges are to what other job seekers challenges are and then over time that builds up and you will you will win business and you will find work by just building your LinkedIn presence, but it takes time. You've got to be consistent yeah. with it. So there's a huge opportunity for candidates and clients to do. Yeah, I agree. It, it, it does take time. And I wanted to ask you about new talent coming in. So like, you know, what if they don't have any experience and stuff like that? Yeah. I mean, typically the people that I work with would be the senior end of the market. So they been in the industry for five, 10, 15 years plus. So it's rare that I would speak to a graduate or someone with experience in the quality field that's looking to go into it. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that's probably an, an area where I could advise coherently about what they should do. However, I suppose at the, at the same time, it's like learning anything, right? Build understand what you want to do so if it's quality assurance i think you put a post up recently on linkedin which is really good about you know what to do if you're you know how to get a job or how to start out in quality assurance and that was spot on you know you 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 learn your field do a master's in quality assurance or whatever you're in then you you identify this the key companies that would hire in your in your given field you identify the key stakeholders you connect you engage you use linkedin and and much the same with the personal branding it takes time but learn the niche really dig into that niche really immerse yourself in that niche and opportunities will come i think there's opportunities for you know i speak to a lot of directors and vps and 
whenever they get excited about the thought of mentoring people and bringing on young talent, you know, even outside of their own businesses. So there's there's probably an opportunity for people to reach out and gain mentorship from senior leaders. I'm sure there'd be plenty of people. People want to help each other. So there's, you know, like like you said on that LinkedIn post, I thought that was spot on for someone that would want to go into you know, field with no experience. Yeah, and and somebody had messaged me that day, and they linked some other post from a like a previous post that I had made a week before that, and they said, "Oh, you know, this is interesting." Blah blah blah. Like, I really want to know how I can get in, and I don't want to say the name of the person or the organization they're associated with. I know them both really well, but this person wanted to be anonymous. They didn't want their employer to know but they really want to get into quality assurance, right? So so when I, I put a screenshot of the message, I blurred out their name and I said, hey, I'm going to post this because it's going to make this more relatable because a lot of people send me that same question every week. Hey, I have no experience or I don't have experience in QMS, but I have quality control experience. How do I go there? Like, okay, so it's the answer was like, I didn't want to, she wanted to talk to me and do like a 20 minute call. But I said, you know what? I'm just going to write this out because then I don't want to have three other 20 minute calls and tell the same thing to yeah. three other people. So yeah, yeah, yeah that yeah, was, exactly. that was me thinking back what I should have done. And obviously I didn't follow everything that I wrote in that post, but if I were to do it today, that's what I would do. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's a good step-by-step process on how to how to get into it. So outside of, are there any resources or any events or anything that you can share for people who have no prior experience? Like how can they learn, like you said, you know, one thing is they should learn about the basic skill set for a QA role. So can you share any resources or conferences or events that they can go to to get up to speed? Yeah, I mean, it depends on what region you're in. I suppose you've got global quality conferences that are often happen. The MHRA Symposium in the UK is happening right now. I think it's a three-day event in, in London. I think the Global Quality Conference is next month in Washington, which is a, you know a, a happens every three years. I think becoming a member of your particular societies, I suppose, there's a Society of Quality Assurance. And you've got the various sponsorship and companies that sponsor people becoming key peas. I think there's there's lots of things. I think you've got to, just got to do your research uh, out there, speak to people, what 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 conferences are people going to at your level, um, and then just do your research, become a member, and, and and like I said, immerse yourselves into it. I think that's the you know the best best way to go about it. Yeah, one thing that somebody shared with me uh, a couple of weeks ago, and this is a networking hack if anybody wants to to try this out. What this person said is that they look at industry events. So like you said, World Quality Conference or MHRA Symposium. So they would go to that event and see who's attending if that information is available on LinkedIn. And then they would go through that list and find out who is their ideal uh, boss or an employer or person they want to work with and just send them. It's a good opener to say, hey, I see you going to this event. I'd love to meet you in person and, you know, face to face or whatever. And it's an easy opener to to send out to someone. More likely, they're going to accept your connection request and meet you in person. And then, you know, whatever stems out of that. But this person does that on a consistent basis. And that's the way to connect with people. We used, we used to do some, yeah, we, we try and get a delegate list for the MHRA symposium. And even if we, you know, tickets are expensive, right? When you're starting out, you can't, sometimes you can't afford to go um, and have a stand. But yeah, find out who's going, go and try and sneak in through the back door <laughs> and get, you know, grab a coffee with someone if yeah. you can. <laughs> probably a bit of security these days, so I probably wouldn't get away with that now. But, but Yeah, but still there's a lot of virtual events too that are free. So it's not always, and then even the in-person events, many a times they have student discounts and stuff like that. If you're still in, college or school graduating and you're trying to get a job before you're done so yeah i think the society of quality assurance is a good one to become a member of i'm a member of it always webinars happening there's always uh, events you can they're generally free to attend so it's a good way to learn your trade and meet new people agreed yeah i've seen some of your posts the where you talk about quality culture q 
QMS strategy and you give some actionable tips. It's it's interesting to see that from somebody who's in the recruitment field because you're not just talking about, hey, here's how to hire a QA person. You're actually giving out actionable tips. So can you share a couple of them for any organization that's in the process of building a QMS or a quality culture in their company? Yeah, of course. I mean, look, I generally speak to people every day, so I'm asking them. I, I'm asking these questions to them all the time. So these are, I, I don't, I'm not an expert, a particular, you know, real expert in, in in this. Apart from the fact that I recruit into it, I suppose to recruit into it, you need to have an awareness and understanding of what people do and the challenges. And I think building a quality culture has always been a challenge since I can remember since, you know, since the days I started recruiting into quality. Um, one of the biggest frustrations that leadership teams or quality senior leaders, senior quality leaders have would be, um, you know, I put a post up about the quality beliefs um, the other day, you know, stuff that, that kind of culture where um, the business sees quality as a, um, an you know an obstacle or a or or a blocker to creating products or getting products out the door right everyone knows that the you know the the goal of biotech and um, pharma companies is to get their product to the patient get their product to the market um, as as quickly and as safely as possible right and if a quality function is there saying no hang on you you need to do x y and z to really manage that relationship with different functions is a really hard difficult job so the person that is overseeing the quality function whether that's the director the vp the chief quality officer they have to be an exceptional collaborator they have to be a really really strong communicator and they have to be able to work cross-functionally with people in ops in sales in marketing whatever the function is because if they're telling them no hang on we need to do this we can't we, you know let's just hold the horses a minute that then is is a challenge for that department um so they need to be able to manage that relationship so communication is really important in, in building it collaboration is really important cross cross-functional collaboration um and and then making sure that your team your quality team are bought in all right because you're their you're essentially their champion there you're responsible for them as a unit and so you want to create a strong unit underneath you that they understand your challenges um, and they they're bought in uh, i was talking to someone the other day about sort of qms perspective as well like a lot of companies will go out and spend hundreds and thousands of pounds on a qms when they don't necessarily need to spend that much right, right? so there's some good people out there that you know you and you will know is that you can get a q you need a qms which is fit for purpose and if you get one which isn't quite fit for purpose again that can create problems down the line it can create aminosity in your team you can struggle to get buy-in from your from your colleagues um, so all of that comes down to the the leader, the leadership team, um, and making sure that the the focus on quality is is very very apparent within the business. Um, because if you don't have that, that can lead to compliance issues later down the line. Yeah. Um, so talking about compliance issues, I know a lot of companies who have the best QMS out on the market, and they still deal with gaps in, in compliance or gaps in other kind of things because a QMS software is designed for you to manage your users and your documentation and the workflows or transactions that those users are doing with that documentation, right? It's not focused at building a practice of quality management or building habits like those have to happen outside of your QMS. Maybe someday, someday in the future, we'll have a QMS with artificial intelligence that really brings that personalized element to build those habits as you're approving a document or approving a record. But as of today, they're just document repositories with you know extra features on. And I feel like people do a good job of implementing a QMS, but they don't do as much of a good job of building the right habits or the mindset of how you should function in a QA role. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, and that, you know, I, like I said, I, I recruit into the industry. So I'm talking to people every day about their challenges and that, that, that building the culture, especially in an early stage in the business is really, really important. 
Yeah, I know a lot of people listening to this are, I don't remember the last time we were in a situation like this in the industry where there were so many layoffs, so many people, literally every day I open LinkedIn, I see a post, somebody being laid off and other people are supporting them. I haven't been in this situation where I was laid off without any future plans, but what can you tell to a person who's listening this, let's say they were laid off this week, what should they do in the yeah. next 30 or 60 days to get closer to their next opportunity? Yeah, so it's a great question. And so 30 days, I think, get your LinkedIn profile right. So make sure that it's clear that if someone was to look at your LinkedIn profile, they would instantly know what you do. And then and, and then you work, in, you know, work with the recruiter to get that right if you need help with that. Getting your, your resume or your CV in, in the right way, I think, you don't need to put big loads of fancy jargon in your first opening paragraph using lots of corporate spiel. I think just really clearly explain what you do, why you do it, what are your key achievements throughout your career and what you bring to a, a new company and then go on to list. So really make sure that your CV or resume is in, is in, a, is in a good, easy to read um, format. If you're looking for work, then I'd say references are, are really important as well. I always say to a candidate, a job seeker who's on the market, if you've got references, it really enhances, I suppose, any applications we make. Because there's one thing me saying, right, this is harsh. He's got 20 years experience in QMS, et cetera. This is what he's achieved. But there's another thing saying, well, here, here are two people, one that he's managed directly and one that he's reported into, vouching for that. In a, you know, and backing up my statement. So I think references add a lot of weight to someone's approach. And then I suppose like really working with a recruiter, now moving in, in that first 30 days, working with the recruiter to figure out your ideal company persona that you want to try and target, who the type of people are. If you're a quality director, right? I want to be approaching VPs in this area. If you're a QA specialist and you want to be going for manager level, et cetera. So really making sure that your recruiters are clear on the type of persona that they need to approach um, and then build a company, map a company shortlist they, that you're trying to going to try and approach. Um, I suppose then 60 days, you know, hopefully you would then start getting some traction. You know, your CV your profile would have been sent out to a few companies, hopefully. Um, you know, you may, you may even start getting interviews, um, at that stage. So I think making sure that you're keeping regular contact with your recruiters, you're doing research into your companies that you're interviewing or companies that you've been, appro you're approaching. Um, I think sometimes when you see link, you know, there's so many companies that advertise their roles on LinkedIn. Don't be afraid. I always say to a candidate, if you see something that's on LinkedIn, feel free just to send it to send the link or whatever to me. And I can see nine times out of 10, I'll know someone there that I can try and approach. Um, and a lot of time candidates profiles don't even get in front of the manager when they apply by these LinkedIn um, adverts. So um, if you see things like that, and I suppose, you know, three months in, you would hopefully be at a stage where you've had some interviews now um, and you get into offer stage. And I think that's at the point now where you want to be, um, you, want, you really want to be consulting with your agency around what the best opportunities are, what the what what the um, what the opportunity looks like, and you know what's your progression for the next year, three years, five years within this company. Um, and I think you want to be. This is where recruiters need to be really honest and open with their assessment, and because they they they've got the insights of the company. Um, you know, I, I'll always say, I'll always be honest. Like I've been, I've had situations before where I've had a candidate who's had an offer at a specific role through me, but they've also had an offer at another company. And I've, you know, not deep down, I'm thinking, right, this opportunity that you've got for another agency is actually the best one, you know, and I've got to be honest uh, in that situation. I'll be honest with that individual um, and say, look, go, you know, this other opportunity is probably a bit better if I'm, if I'm being brutally honest. So let's, you know, if you if you want to take that, I'm not going to stand in your way. Obviously, I'd love to work with you on this one, but I'll I would go for the other one if I were you. So I think you've got to be, you really want to be working with recruiters that can that are honest, firstly, and have, and have your interests at heart. Um, but we typically take forty five to sixty days to you know from initial qualification call to place someone. So um, you know, within ninety days, you'd be hoping that you've at least had some interviews and some offers. Um, market specific, obviously.
Yeah, it's it's one important point that you mentioned about references and I just wanted to add on to that is references as part of the job interview or the job process. Yes, you can provide contact details, but as you're networking with people or if you're if you've been laid off and you're trying to build your presence, don't forget about the social proof side of it, right? If you worked with somebody in the past, just ask them to give you a recommendation on LinkedIn. Because now when people come to your profile, they can see that past person who worked with you. You know, it's LinkedIn has a great feature for recommendation where you can say, I worked with so-and-so or I managed, like you exactly said, you managed this person or you reported to this person. And if that's on your LinkedIn profile, in many cases, I've even told a recruiter like, hey, I've had the references on my LinkedIn. Is that fair? You can contact them. And in many cases employers don't even contact because they can see the reference on your on your LinkedIn profile, which is social proof. So so that's just anybody going there, don't forget about doing that because it also works wonders. So any any big goals for you, either personal or R, for Rx Group IO, what are you up to in 2023? <laughs> yeah. Stay um yeah. The 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 goal for this year is to get the business up and running. That's got the number one uh, personal goal for me um you know it's it's um it's only been five weeks so far and we've got a you know long year ahead but if if at the end of this year i can look back and say that we, we're we're on the right path and we're we're in a position where we've got some good we've got some good customers that we're working with with we're, we're we're living our purpose our purpose is creating a healthier future for our customers and that's you know whether that's directly with candidates or clients if we can look back and say we've lived our purpose and we've helped companies bring products to market we've got some good customers then i think we'd be in a good position so yeah that's that's the that's the the big one for me outside of that trying to trying to get fitter yeah. <laughs> um when you sit when you're sitting at your desk 14 hours a day you can become a bit um yeah, it can become a bit lazy with going to the gym so i've got a personal trainer so i'm trying to get trying to do exercise three times a week go for walks working us hours i i um you, you get your mornings to to go for a walk or do you to go to the gym so that helps so yeah they're they're the mate they're the they're, that's yeah the, the company getting the company off the ground and, and having a good year is the, is the key one for me okay yeah that's that uh, fitness seems to be a common goal for a lot of people so what do you like doing outside of work when you're not reviewing resumes or talking to talking to clients what do you do to de-stress or unwind uh, I'm, I'm only doing i'm only doing this at the moment <laughs> um what i do i play cricket so i yeah i am um, i've played cricket from the age of about eight eight or nine years old i, rep, I played f- sort of a county stuff in the uk growing up and played for my club my local club here we've got it's my mug here and you're gonna see the cricket oh yeah cricket's been a big part of my life so yeah i do that at the weekends in the summer i play a bit of golf sometimes spend time with with family my my partner she's been excellent throughout all of this and my family have been good i think that's one thing that you need if you're going to do this sort of thing is someone who's backing yeah. you and who gives you the support that you need 100 um, and the confidence that you need to do that as you know so yeah making sure i'm making time for my family friends partner is is really important so yeah they're the they're the main things but yeah at the moment it's a lot lot of time spent on this right, chair yeah. at this desk top, <laughs> top top three cricketers of all time who who do you have on that list oh <laughs> sorry to put you on I'm the spot sure. but i'm sri lankan so i'm gonna be a bit biased um Kumar Sangakkara has got to be my number one. Okay. Um, I will. Fr- I will say Sachin Tendulkar. Yep. Um, although Vera, Virat's Virat's probably um, creeping into that list at the moment. Yeah. In the modern era. Um, and um, third, I'd, I'd I'd have to say Brian Lara. Uh, great one. Yeah. That's a great one. What about you? Are you a cricket man? Yeah, I've I've don't play as much. I followed a lot of it when I was back in India. I moved to US in two thousand seven. My favorite moments were obviously India Pakistan watching Shahid Afridi versus Tendulkar or Wasim Akram. So that was a good matchup to watch. I also liked a lot of the Australian and Indian cricket series, Test and One Days. So I'm talking like Shane Warne, Glenn McGrath. Uh, 
and you know Sachin and Ganguly. So th- I-, I watched cricket in that era. So those are some of my favorite players. Yeah, brilliant. Well, my dreams to go. I'd love to go to India and watch some, watch some, watch a Test match or, or watch an IPL game. It'd be amazing. All right. So, do you want to give any shout out to any roles that you're hiring for, or anything that you want to share with the audience to reach out uh, to help you out? No, I mean, look, I, I suppose just as um, you know, not, nothing specific, but I would say that if you, you know. We, we focus purely within the quality assurance space in the US field. Um, over the last few weeks, I've been building relationships and connecting with with people that hopefully I will keep relationships with over the next you know however many years. So if you're a, if you're looking for work or if you need talent, I would love to speak with you. I'd love to understand what you're looking for, and if it leads to a, a relationship or something that I can support you with, then then that'd be great. But no. Um, thank you thank you for having me on yeah and what's what's the best place for people to get in touch with you yeah linkedin's fine linkedin linkedin is probably the best place the easiest place i'm on there every day so you can't can't escape it (laughs) (laughs) yeah well you know thank you so much it's it's been great we've interacted with each other on our you know through linkedin content but never met in person and that's off checked off the list so thank you so much for coming on and sharing everything that you're doing any final thoughts you want to add before we wrap up no pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, Harsh. It's been great to speak with you and uh, meet with you at long last after engaging with each other's LinkedIn uh, content for, for for a while. So no, thank you very much for having me. It's been it's been great. Yep, and wish you all the success with RX Group IO. Cheers. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it.